Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode number 88. As always, my name is Mark. Here with me today is Amber. Hi, everyone. And today we're going to be talking about tile lane games. Pretty much because that's what we've been playing lately. Yeah. And they're fun, and they had this connection between them. Although I will admit that this is probably the least prepared I have ever been (laughs) for a podcast. The last few weeks have been wild, and I don't know. Maybe it'll end up being good. Oftentimes, the podcasts I feel the worst about going in end up being the best ones. So by that measure, this could be our greatest podcast ever. True. And I never prepare for anything, just so everyone knows. I think people understand this. (laughs) But... Yeah, let's talk about how Tile Lane works and what makes it so compelling. Because as I was thinking, many of my favorite games are Tile Lane games. Like, I like a lot of them. And I was being pretty strict with my definition of what Tile Lane is. And the list I've compiled here is some of my favorite games. So, let's start with... Do we want to go over the list of games? Sure, just throw some out there so everyone yeah, so has perspective. I, I guess this was inspired by... I recently bought Carpe Diem, the most dull-looking game in the shop. It was a kid's shop. <laughs> it was a kid's toy store, basically. Yeah, yeah, we were on vacation. Yeah, we went to the game store. No, the, the toy store. True. And it was an explosion of color. And I, I bought the most colorful puzzle there. Yes. And then I was looking at their board game selection because I like to see what the board game selections are of the places I go into. And it was really, it was good. They had two whole shelves, like two whole aisles of games or one aisle, two shelves on both sides. I would say, yeah, they had like two units of, we'll say two half units, or like one and a half. I don't know. More than that. Of strategy games. Oh. And then probably three to four more units of like party, family, kids mm-hmm. games. Mm-hmm. So it was a it was a kids store. Like most of it was action figures and I don't know. Did they have like Lego? I don't remember. I know they had hoverboards. Yeah, Amber wants a hoverboard. I do. I I would break my leg. Uh, anyways, it was full of color and vibrancy, and I pretty sure I bought the dullest looking item in the store Mm -hmm. with Carpe Diem. But fortunately, it was a very fun game. I had heard good things because a lot of Stefan Feld, I don't love Stefan Feld. I'd love Castles of Burgundy, which is another tile laying game. But I haven't necessarily loved the other Feld games I've played, which have been Trajan, Bora Bora. I really disliked my play of that. I'm trying to remember what the others are. I think I've played one other of his heavier games, and it was pretty forgettable. But I'd heard good things about Carpe Diem, so I I ended up picking it up. And I don't think it's necessarily as good as Castles of Burgundy, but it was interesting. And it again does tile lane. It was a lot of fun, and it was simpler in a way, or in its design, than Castles of Burgundy. So I could see it appealing to a broader audience. Oh, I disagree. What? No. No, Castles of Burgundy is so busy. What? It is. You have so many different types of tiles and the pictures are really tiny. Carpe Diem is, it feels simpler. It feels easier and it feels like more of a coherent picture. Whereas Castles of Burgundy feels like a heavy strategy game. Even if it's not, if you've played that kind. No. Yeah. They're very, very similar. Carpe Diem has a more complex scoring mechanism. That's the major difference. Yeah, but I also feel like it would appeal to someone who hasn't played this kind of game before more than Castles of Burgundy. Oh, I completely disagree. Really? Absolutely. Because you have to you have to get your mind around the scoring mechanism. So how how it works is that you're drafting tiles, it's squares instead of hexagons, and you're trying to fit them together. There's the whole, you have to fit them together and plan a lot more than Castles of Burgundy because Castles of Burgundy, the only restriction is the color of the tile. 
like the category of tile it is is limited by where you're putting it on the board. Yeah. In this one, it's it's restricted by the sides matching, which is a little bit more complex. And in Castles of Burgundy, your scoring is consistent all the way through. In Carpe Diem, you have to plan for claiming certain scoring con- uh, conditions, and you have to plan it around the possibility of other people claiming the scoring conditions that you want to take. Sure. I'm not saying objectively that Carpe Diem is simpler. I'm saying it feels simpler. It looks simpler. And I think it'd be more appealing to a first-time player of either game. I really believe this. And this is how I felt playing these games. I really want to hear people in the comments to see if they agree. I think Carpe Diem looks more complex. Really? Well, it looks uglier. Which I guess is a bold statement because many people call know. Castles of Burgundy like the ugliest game ever. I disagree. I don't think Carpe Diem is uglier. I think Castles of Burgundy is. I think Carpe Diem has pieces that look far too similar to one another when they, they're distinct. And it's really annoying. Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe it's more of a toss up since we both disagree on this. Well, no, I think I'm right. Do you? Yes, I do. I think we would have to pull some first-time tile well, laying game players. Let's look at Board Game Geek. Let's look at Board Game Geek. What do, what do the people, what do the masses say? Okay. I don't know, but doesn't isn't Castle of Burgundy far more popular? Yeah. Um, this might give us information, but I don't know if it's definitive, Mark. Okay. The original Castles of Burgundy is at, at a flat three. Three out of five. What is this measuring? Weight of the game. Oh, well, I don't think I'm necessarily saying weight. That's what, and that's what complexity. No. <laughs> it It's not objective complexity. It's it's the feel of the game. Well, that's what it's, this is measuring. It's it, how... It doesn't, the measurement on Board Game Geek is just a poll. Like, it's it's how, just whatever people want to put in. It's how approachable the game is. Like, All right. Yeah. Carpe Diem. Whoa, the... Oh, Holy moly. They have it at 2.5. 2.51. So I'm right? <laughs> According to Board Game Geek. What? I'm not saying it's objective. I'm saying it's a feeling. It's an approach. What? My mind has been blown. Castles of Burgundy is just so busy looking, whereas Carpe Diem is simpler looking, even if the strategy is more complex. I'll grant you, Carpe Diem... It is tighter. It's harder. It it's harder to to get a strategy that you think can win. But Castles of Burgundy kind of feels like it's really difficult to get that strategy, even if it's not. Wow! I just clicked on a random picture of Carpe Diem, and there's a version of this game that has much more distinct art. Huh? There must be multiple versions. Weird. Huh? What would make people think Carpe Diem is that much lighter? I can't think. Like, it's there's the, so much the that's board. similar. It's the board. The board is so simple here. There's defined buildings. There's defined plots of land. You're building things that are not long in length. They're not complex. They're really easy. The scoring mechanism, granted, but is in complex. in Castles of Burgundy, you're not adjoining things at all. But things look so busy. The game just looks busy. Am I a weirdo? <laughs> <laughs> Am I a crazy person? You've played so much Castles of Burgundy. I think you'd forget how complex it looks to someone who doesn't play these kinds of games. I guess with the it's yellow inti- tiles. It's intimidating. Is it? It is. What's wrong with me? <laughs> Where's <laughs> my mind? It's been warped by experience. You should count on me. Anyways, wow, that's not going to leave my mind anytime soon. <laughs> Anyways, that's uh, that's that was the inspiration for this podcast was buying Carpe Diem. Weird. All right, let's back up. Tile laying. What is it? It is the laying of tiles. Yes, but what are tiles really? Well, they're not dice. But they're could not they be? Ca- no. And they're not cards. But they could be. No. Like, isn't Sprawlopolis a tile-laying game? You were trying to convince me of this, and I go back and forth. Like, the more I think about it, the more I think it's not really. It's a pocket card game. 
I don't think it can be a tile ale game. Just because it's cards? But it could so easily just be tiles. But it's not. But they're cards in the function of a tile. Right? When we think of tile lane. I mean, none of none of the games on our list. Did you actually tell people what's on our list? Or did we just... Oh, yeah. No, sorry. Here's the games. I think I picked the ones that I like the most that were under the Board Game Geek tile placement mechanism list. Sure. So I've got Castles of Burgundy, Carpe Diem, Suburbia, Carcassonne. Sorry, if you hear the cat in the background, he's very happy right now and playing and chirping. He has his little blue mouse toy. He's chasing it all over. What a fun cat. Uh, Galaxy Trucker, Heaven and Ale, My City, Sprawlopolis, Seikatsu, Pipeline, 18xx Games, and Pass Tally. And I've played most of these, so I actually... I excluded the games where Tile Lane was a very small part of it. Like Twilight Imperium, where it's just like part of the setup almost. Yeah, it. Twilight I mean, sure, it has a tw- tile lane aspect to it, but it's not a tile lane game. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Similar with eighteen XX, that's kind of borderline. I, it, depending on the eighteen XX, it's like half tile lane, half not. Same, similar with with, with uh, pipeline. So I don't know. I included it if it was a major part of the game and it was tile lane. So. The more I think about it, the more it's not particularly defined. Because, again, I think it could be cards and have the same... Like, Sprawlopolis and Carcassonne are very similar to each other in what you're doing. You're playing things onto the onto the table where adjacency is, like, the game. Mm-hmm. And so then I was thinking... It's not necessarily the case, but tile lane is interesting because there are so many possible variables at play. So it's not just necessarily which tile you have. And then obviously certain games, which tile you have can matter or how the method of choosing the tile can be a big part of the game. So in, in the Feld games and in Suburbia, it's a draft uh, which determines which tiles you're playing. In My City and Carcassonne, you're just given the tile. In Carcassonne, you choose, you just grab one at, at random. In My City, it's a card flip that determines what tile you're playing. In Pipeline, you kind of draft. In Seikatsu, you have a couple. You're constantly rotating from a couple in hand. In 18xx games, you just play the tile. There's not a draft at all. It's just I I can buy this tile and I just choose the appropriate one. Uh, so there's lots there's lots to the game potentially in drafting or selecting the tile that you have. And then there's of course how you utilize the tile. And if it's a square tile. It's effectively could be used in the same way a cube would be, a three-dimensional object, not just a two-dimensional object, which is, I guess, where you could argue that card games can't be tile lane, but not all tile lane games use all the dimensions, mm-hmm. right? But if you have a if you have a square piece, a square piece of cardboard, you could utilize all six dimensions there, all four sides, plus what you put what you place the tile upon, like in Castles of Burgundy matters. Mm -hmm. And you could even play three-dimensionally where you put things on top of the tiles, like in Pass Tally, where you're trying to build up vertically, Mm -hmm. um, which I think makes it super compelling. And then, of course, if it's a hexagon, the best shape, I just actually, I I watched a video that I'd never heard of the other day. It's called Hexagons are the (laughs) Best-A-Guns. And it goes into details about how awesome hexagons are. This is definitely something you would watch. It was actually kind of dull and I didn't watch the whole thing, but it it, it made the correct argument that they are, in fact, the best of guns. <laughs> so every time now I say hexagon, I I want to comment that it is also the, the best of gun. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, you have a hexagon... Uh, That's eight different dimensions in terms of just placement and adjacency. And I think that's really what Tile Lane is about. It's about geographic adjacency across multiple ways. And then that makes a lot of interest. I think there's there's so many variables at play that you you can form, you can take those variables 
and focus on certain ones uh, or utilize all of them to kind of mold the experience that you want. But Mark, but Mark, you're making this sound boring. <laughs> the, what? The, I thought a, that whole monologue was super exciting. For for gamers, maybe. No, no, no. The tiling games is all about physically building a unique world or a unique experience. Using, of course, all the tools that you just mentioned. But that sounds so much more exciting. Well, that was my it, next point. But it is exciting. On the list. Oh, I thought that was the Actually, point Actually, it was two, two points hmm? down my list. Growth. Oh, I'm, I'm, oh, I didn't know that's what that meant. <laughs> <laughs> you make it sound boring on your list, too. <laughs> now you're saying my notes are boring. Well, they're notes. But they're going to be boring. <laughs> But I agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gr- growing and building, you know, is is kind of a cornerstone of Euro game design, and it's fun. It's fun to start with something small, and it's fun to build that thing up. I mean, that's that was the big kind of deal with Carcassonne. Is it Carcassonne or Carcassonne? I don't know. I always said Carcassonne, but that might I be wrong. I did too, and I just switched today for no reason at all, and I don't know why. Anyways, I think that was the big deal when Carcassonne came out in 2000, I believe, was that it was pitched as you build the... It's a board game where you build the board, and that's Mm -hmm. the game, Mm -hmm. which is cool because you start with nothing. You start literally with an empty table, and then you build up. Uh, Suburbia has a very similar thing. We played it a couple of times recently. I love Suburbia. It's so fun. I think mm-hmm. people have kind of forgotten about it, but it's really good. Mm-hmm. It's like really, really good. Mm-hmm. And it's good, and this is beside the point for a tile lane focused discussion, but I think it's good because you can really miserably lose that game. Like it's it's kind of Well, brutal. you can. Yeah. Like it's not one of those games that holds your hand. Like you can really make bad early decisions and then just be in the dumps. But you don't see a lot. Uh, yeah, but it's one of those games, too, where even if you make early, really bad decisions, you don't necessarily feel too bad about them until the end when all the points are tallied. <laughs> you can still enjoy well, playing bad. it. I lost really bad the first game we played. I felt bad the whole time. I mean, it was still fun. I always thought I would catch up, even though I did just as poorly as you, if not worse. <laughs> oh, I, I knew there was no hope. But it's still oh. fun to build up your little suburb. Yeah, it like is. The growth of it is the fun part. Yeah, and you can still feel like you've built a good city, even if someone else has built a city that's just far better than yours. Yeah, and it's also got the fun thematic thing where you could actually look and it 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 has form that resembles an actual town, mm-hmm. unless you really played horribly but i mean the incentives are aligned so you kind of make it look like an actual town yeah last time i played i put a toxic waste dump right next to a lake which was super fun (laughs) it was a border and it was toxic waste and i just kind of it it didn't want to be next to anything but it had to be next to something so i put it next to my lake and it just stuck out awkwardly very thematic yes but yeah the building of it the building of it is really really fun and that's where i think Suburbia Carcassonne, I said it the other way, they have a bit of an advantage because you're kind of constructing from an empty table that I don't think games like Castles of Burgundy or Heaven and Ale necessarily have uh, because you're you're putting the tiles on top of a, a, a game component. You're putting it on top of a sheet. Okay, yeah, so they don't, they don't have this growth element that you're talking about, but I'm still arguing that you're still creating a unique world in that game, which I really like about tile lane games. And I think it, it applies to all tile lane games to some degree. To some degree. I, yeah. yeah, I think some some games grasp that aspect of it better than others. Sure. A Carcassonne, Going... it's just one of the best in that yeah, regard. Yeah, for sure. And it's one of the the first games that I actually played. We bought it really, really early on when I was getting into the game hobby. Um, and it's it was just so much fun. I think you described it once as such a pleasant game. 
Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, Even though it can be really mean. Oh, it's brutal. I always kill you with the farms. They are the farms, right? Yes. Yes, yes. You're much better at that game than I am. For sure. <laughs> Uh, but it's pleasant, it, and you're just building this beautiful world full of farmland and chapels and random people. I don't know. Yeah. Seikatsu is yeah. a similar thing, very yeah. pleasant Yeah, in, in its aesthetics. And even the method of play is pleasant. You're laying a tile, and it's not Psychotsu's super aggressive. all about the physicality of those pieces, right? They're, they're really nice feeling in your hands, feel good when you place them they feel good holding them yeah yeah that was key and i remember Mm -hmm. when we had isaac on the podcast he mentioned that 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 was something they really fought for even though it Mm -hmm. increased the price of the game by a good amount Mm -hmm. having those particular plastic pieces was was key to that going back to the boring stuff what Hmm. you called the boring stuff i didn't okay i didn't mean that it was that boring i'm just saying there's more exciting ways to describe it being the boring guy it's (laughs) all right the only other thing I wanted to add to that, though, was that right, you have all these different dimensions and variables at play. So you have, again, the selection of the pieces, how you actually acquire the tiles for the tile lane can be part of a really rich part of the game. Mm-hmm. How you place the tiles in relationship to the game board, in relationship to other tiles, again, across all those dimensions, uh, can be very rich and interesting. And I think, however that visually a ton of information is communicated with fairly simple pieces if you want it to be as long as it's not castles of burgundy (laughs) don't understand they're so complicated criticism (laughs) like suburbia is not that complex but like if you look at all the information you're checking like on the player aid it's like an eight step process every Mm -hmm. game Mm mm-hmm but it's all right there in front of you, and it's not that annoying to check it. And then you have something like Galaxy Trucker, where where navigating the connections between the pieces and the relationship to one another is a bit more, I don't know, not necessarily complex, but the timed element, the real-time element, makes that part of the game. But I think if you have a game like that that is too annoying to to deal with in order to understand the relationships between the tiles uh, it doesn't work so i think Mm -hmm. the idea that you can communicate a lot of information in a relatively small component with the tile lane game is really fascinating to me yeah i think the time element is important there because galaxy trucker really limits it where the types of connections there's only three types And so, yes, your brain has to search for the answer, but you can do that in a short period of time. Whereas Suburbia, you will be looking at all of the tiles for longer because you're looking at your own board while other players take their turns. You're studying the tiles, you're studying the tiles that come out as possibilities, and you have more time to look at them. So there's more information that can be stored there. And I guess your brain brain can process the information on those tiles within the time that is anticipated between turns. But I think with Castles of Burgundy, sometimes that time element is lost because the person, especially if it's Mark, um, will take their turn very quickly, whereas you are still lost in the pieces, lost in their meaning don't know what's happening in the game and all of that and i don't know it, that's true you do have to like you you need to understand especially with the tan tiles in castles of burgundy you need to understand what all of eight buildings mean yeah and so there's a disconnect there but yeah maybe that's a flaw in the visual design of castles of burgundy but you look is there any other game component where so much information can be so densely packed, like so much strategic information? Like people so, talk about cards, and sure, yeah. yeah, like you can hold in your hand a ton of information between cards, but the relationship between how you play those cards and other areas of the game are physically separate. Mm-hmm. In a tile laying game, not only can the information be densely packed like a card because it's just a two-dimensional plane on which you can put text and symbols and such, but the 
the way that individual piece interacts with the rest of the game is literally right next to it physically, Mm -hmm. which I think makes that communication easier. Well, also tiles are better at, at conveying visuals than cards are because when you're holding cards, if you have multiple cards in your hand, you're always hiding some aspect of that information. So, Visually, I think that's limiting. I think cards are better for text. Way. Cards are easier to hide information from other players. No, no yeah, yeah. And still read it. So that's the advantage with cards. Is that yeah. You can hold them, hide them from other players, and still examine them. Tiles, it's harder to do that. You can't hold as many at a time unless they're like card sized. Right. But in tile laying games, often there's not that much information that needs to be hidden. Seikatsu is one where you do somewhat hide the information but you only have a couple in your hand at one, any given time um, all these other games most of the information is available to all players and all players are figuring out how to manipulate their board or the collective board using the tiles that are available to everyone right yeah and no that's a that's a good point so you know obviously there's there's different strengths and weaknesses with both components but i think the physical proximity between tiles and the rest of the game board in in most of these games or or the rest of the components that you are considering Mm -hmm. makes it easier to communicate more complex information yeah especially in games where you can like hover the tile over and like consider different different placements Mm -hmm. which, which is interesting because and I think Ludology, the, the Ludology podcast had an episode of, on this about different zones of play of where you have different physical zones where components live and different aspects of the game live. And the more zones you have to think through at once, it becomes more cognitively complex. And I think this is where this this is displayed, like where you can see this happening where... You know, if you're playing a card and it's manipulating aspects of the board that may be slightly more burdensome to the mind than if you're placing a tile next to another tile and those two things interact. Because then they're just right there in one visual space rather than looking from the card to the board as two different like eye movements, two different things to look at and having to connect them mentally. I really like that point. I like how you say burdensome to the mind. Some games are so burdensome to the mind. And I love tiling games, I think, because it, it, because you, like you said, you can physically manipulate the tile to see different orientations and how they impact the game board and how they impact game play. And to me, that's so important because, sure, if I, if I think about something really hard over and over I can probably tell how it's going to impact the game in every scenario but it's faster just to see it Um, and sometimes just turning that piece and orienting it so that you can see it on the board it it makes gameplay go faster it makes gameplay more satisfying Um, yeah it's it's a pleasant experience (laughs) going back to how you described Carcassonne originally Mm mm-hmm yeah yeah, so maybe that's the real benefit of tile lane, I mean, or maybe a major benefit of tile lane. It and, takes... it, and it shows how important graphic design is in a yes. game. Mm-hmm. Like, tile lane is just a very tidy bit of graphic design almost, in some aspects, or at least it illustrates the principle. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I was originally thinking of this as the tiles kind of taking away some of the abstraction, but I don't think that's true. In some ways, they abstract things more, but in a way that makes it easier for you to assemble the information in your mind, absorb it, and then implement it into the game. And when I think of complex ideas like that, I'm always thinking of, is this abstract or concrete? But sometimes I think that's a false false dichotomy. Those two things aren't in opposition to each other. So often they're described as things in opposition, though. And the, and the more I think about it, the more I think they're not. 
No, abstract isn't the opposite of concrete. Abstract mm-hmm. doesn't mean fluid. It means no. It means there's. It means representational. there's not a clear picture. Like if you, when I think of concrete, I think of very much of visuals. So when I'm having a dream, for example, sometimes there are no faces in my dreams, and sometimes there are very clear faces in my dreams. One is abstract, and one is concrete. One is the idea of a person, and one is seeing the person. And, and I know that's a really weird analogy. Okay, but I, the, I can see that. Mm, that's definitely how I think of things. And that's translated over to how I'm viewing games. But a lot of times tiles have things that are more abstract. So, for example, in suburbia, income is represented by a circle. Uh, reputations represented by a square on the tile. Those those are taking concrete ideas and making them even more abstract, but by picturing them on a tile all the same way on every tile, you're creating something that the mind can easily understand, even though it's more abstract. I'm realizing now that we use the word abstract to mean almost two completely different things when we're talking about board games versus when we're talking about the visual arts. Because in the visual art, if you're talking about an abstract painting, for instance, it is, in some cases, I think it depends on the type of the the school of thought or whatever, but it may be trying to express something, something subconscious or some, or a feeling or an idea in a more yeah fluid way or more like impressionist way right that's mm-hmm. where you, we get to abstractness is through impressionism in, in painting from what i understand hmm. sometimes there are other aspects of abstraction that are trying to kind of get past the idea of the painting representing anything at all so that's where you get to what's the guy who does the 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 colors and the boxes and the squares and the lines and all that. Mm, I don't remember. Where it's just going to be, where it's the, the kind of abstract painting where it's just a shape in and of itself. Like that's the whole thing. It's just, it's a shape or it is a color. Mm-hmm. Um, there's that kind of abstract, which is I, I think on a slightly deeper level, but there's abstract that's still supposed to be representative of something in painting, but usually it's representative of a more kind of ethereal quality of the thing and not a specific quality of the thing. Whereas when we talk about abstraction in board games, we're talking about simplification of a thing not to try to... Well, sometimes not to try to capture the thing in in its complexity, but to actually simplify it to a a concrete value. Well, no, that's weird too. Right? Because in math... In math, abstraction is often used to simplify things, but you still have to know what is being simplified, right? Like, What do you mean? Like, in the mathematical formulas, something very basic like X is very abstract. Y is very abstract. And it's hard as a child to wrap your mind around those concepts unless you have a good teacher. And... It's because X is representing something. Y is representing something. It's standing in. It's a symbol for something. And that's abstraction. I think that's that's sometimes... That's, that's abstraction in the board game sense, right? Where you're just removing and, and simplifying something to its core elements. Yes, but it is abstract. And I think that's what people forget. But I'm saying but when we talk about like painting... Mm-hmm. We're maybe... Like, sure, there's the... Or maybe I'm, I'm, maybe I'm mixing up. Maybe abstract painting is just fundamentally different from like the impressionist or ex- maybe it's expressionist painting is what I'm thinking of not abstract painting I mean maybe those are just two fundamentally different things actually let me google this real quick I actually know very little about art all right I'm back with a better understanding I was thinking of I was thinking of abstract painting and abstract expressionism as the same thing when they are fundamentally not the same thing. So I was thinking of 
abstract expressionism, although I guess they both use the word abstract. So the idea is abstract expressionism is that you're trying to capture kind of the essence of something through very much not a visual representation of what it is, but hopefully a visual representation of the essence of it. So that's where you get like mm-hmm. Pollock and maybe Pollock. Uh, that you know that's where that's where impressionism leads to. Whereas abstract art is very much art that is trying to get away from representing anything at all except that its own existence. Okay. okay. So that's where you get to the ones that are just like a color or an arrangement, an arrangement of geograph, uh, or excuse me, of uh, geometric ideas for their own sake without any other idea behind it Mm -hmm. other than that it is a thing that that they made Mm -hmm. um so those are two different things so yeah i guess that's still that both use the word abstract and i think those are almost like opposite ideas the idea that you're representing something in its essential way versus not representing something at all where in board games, it's abstraction. The idea of abstraction is almost simplification of the idea to discrete values or properties mm-hmm. until you get to like really abstract games. So even like chess, right, is not purely abstract. Like there's pieces that obviously represent uh, medieval armies. Uh, so there is representation there, but you get to the real abstract stuff that are just like colors and shapes. And I guess you're approaching that where it's just the ideas in and of themselves that aren't representing anything at all. That's interesting. Yeah. But again, it's using the word abstract to mean both representing of another thing and not representing of another thing. Which is a really weird quirk of language. It's, it's, mm-hmm. I don't remember what they're called, but it's a word like cleave, right? Where it means both to bring together and separate. Mm-hmm. I forget what those words are called, where they have uh, two opposite meanings. Anyways, I don't well, remember tangent. that. Yeah, that was a, <laughs> that was a good tangent. We haven't had a really good tangent like that in a long time. Well, no, last podcast, we had a nice tangent about film. <laughs> But yeah, the word abstract, that's weird. That's really weird. I don't know what to do with that. It is weird because a lot of times these games that have lots of abstractions, uh, like for example, uh, which one were, Suburbia, that's the one we were talking about. When you say there's a lot of abstractions, people can think, okay, this is super complicated. This is something that my brain won't be able to wrap around. But then going back to your comment about visual design. Suburbia is also super thematic. It Well, it's thematic, but I don't know necessarily that the theme helps there, especially when you're talking about the circle for income and the square for reputation, right? Well, it's micro thematic. Like the pieces, the pieces incent to... The pieces in scent placement that aligns with how a city kind of yeah, but is laid I, out. But I don't necessarily think that that helps your brain with the abstraction element. And I, I'm struggling to identify or put my finger on, on why it makes sense so easily. Because I, I am not someone who grasps ad- abstract things easily or identifies pictures with ideas easily. And I really struggle with this in board games a lot. I think it's suburbia just because it's it's two shapes. Like it's very there aren't that many shapes, and everything else is in text. Well, then there's the little person shape, and then oh, there's there a lot a of third text, shape. Yeah. and then there's there's like a weird tracker board with different sizes of shape. It it is quite abstract. There's a lot of information there to keep track of, and I've never had a, a an issue with suburbia at all. Um, and so I think it is something to do with the visual design. Yeah, I think the graphic design works there too. Mm-hmm. I also think like you, you, all the different things you have to check when you place a tile in Suburbia radiate out in like concentric circles. So you yeah. first look at like the corner of the tile, then you look at the bottom of the tile, then you look at all the adjacent tiles, and then you look at the rest of the tiles on your board and the borders and such, and then you look 
and like announce or or take into consideration all of your opponents tiles mm-hmm. so it kind of radiates out from the from the tile yeah it's surprisingly orderly <laughs> It doesn't look like it should be when you first look at the game, but yeah, everything makes sense. There's a number of things to check that if like, I were designing that game from scratch, I would probably reject it and be like, this is too much. Like, mm-hmm. This would just be annoying, which is a fear I constantly have when I think about my own game designs is that like I'm rejecting really good ideas because I just think they won't work. Uh, so maybe I need to just try <laughs> bad ideas and, and maybe one of them will work. There's also in Tile Lane the puzzle element. So you have these polyomino games like My City, which is Tile Lane, but it's much more focused on the one dimension of the space that it's taking up and not necessarily the adjacency, which I think is is interesting. Even though it's taking away so many of those different geometric variables that i talked about it's focusing specifically on one my city doesn't exclusively it takes into account adjacency for some of it mm-hmm. uh, but i'm looking up at uh if i can pronounce it Ariel, Ariel. i can't remember the the tetrisy one uh that's kind of the same way and it's the tetris thing right it's just taking into consideration the space that the pieces fill and yet it's really compelling like that's just a compelling aspect of the game uh, and I know Uwe Rosenberg has dealt with this quite a bit in uh, some of his games where he's dealing with, he's working with these polyomino pieces. And even though it's, again, just the one variable, it still makes for interesting decisions. We all like puzzles. That's true. I just did a very large puzzle. Jigsaw I'm puzzle. Very, very proud of myself. Yeah. I love puzzles. I guess it's just the puzzle, the, the jigsaw puzzle element. Well, going back to what we were talking about, like we all like to be able to manipulate pieces to create something, to expand something, to create a unique world. It's very satisfying. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's about that. It's that Euro game growth. Like it's it's growing no, 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 and building no, no, no. something. I don't even think it's Euro game growth because you can have that in some non-tiling games too. Of course. There's something satisfying about the physical tile. Maybe it literally is the jigsaw puzzle element, like the satisfaction of seeing something that fits. It like fits, it, it, it fits, grows. Like there was a place built for it, and you have placed it in that in its place. Like we have this innate idea of completing something or filling a void mm-hmm. that taps into something primal. Maybe that's it. Yeah, and it's not like it has to be an exact fit, but when you find a It's a whole really, lot better than it is. Well yeah, but when you find a really good fit or a creative fit and it just it makes the board look pretty, it makes the board look symmetrical, that's so satisfying. Yeah. Anyways, I love tile laying games. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think there's a lot to think about here. And maybe I'll maybe I'll go into it more into more detail if I come up with any new ideas, but I think it's just such a tidy way to communicate ideas and create interesting decisions. And again, it's so flexible where you can mold, you can take some elements of tile lane and focus on them and just, just a couple of the many elements you could deal with and you focus on those elements and it's still an interesting game with enough depth and enough, competition between the players and blocking and that kind of thing uh that that it can be molded into many different forms sounds good this is worth exploring more i think yeah but this is exhausted my initial thoughts i think i I just love them exactly yeah Yeah. so many good tile laying games well i think that's going to be our podcast for today thanks for listening everybody Don't forget to leave any comments if you have any thoughts or questions or ideas on why Tile Lane works so well and anything we've talked about here. Uh, You can find all kinds of board game stuff at thethoughtfulgamer.com. If you'd like to support the podcast, please go to patreon.com slash thethoughtfulgamer. Other ways you can support us is by following me on social media. I'm on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, or by going and rating and reviewing this podcast on the platform on which you have gotten the podcast. 
they all probably have some way to rate and or review. So do that, please. That was weird. That was really weird. All right. I think that's everything. All right. Bye. Bye, everyone. (laughs) 